You, who's going to do the place tonight? I'll do it. All right. Okay. All right. We're in business. We'll now call this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who's come tonight to the meeting and also those that are viewing the uh, broadcast on G10. Uh, to begin with, uh, we are going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance led by uh, Council Member Angela Washington, followed by the invocation by John Carter, our City Attorney. Please rise. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, as always, we pause to give you thanks. To give you thanks for this beautiful day. To give you thanks for the blessings, the benefits that you bestow upon us individually and upon us collectively as the city of Jacksonville. Our thoughts and our prayers this evening with those who have been so affected by terrorism and Brussels. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are injured. We pray for peace. We also want to remember tonight our former clerk and our TDA member, Mr. Bill Hemingway and his wife, and the loss of their son, Bruce. Comfort all those who mourn. And as always, we give thanks and we pray for our military members who are serving us here and around the world. We pray for their anxious families. Give your guidance and direction to our mayor and to our council as they deliberate our city's business this evening. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So you had an opportunity to look at the agenda for tonight's meeting. I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second. Do I hear any discussion? Uh, with that, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The agenda is hereby adopted. Uh, the first thing tonight, we have some presentations. <laughs> Was that you? I'm glad if you're not me. <laughs> We have a, a couple of presentations, or one presentation tonight, and I'm going to come around front to do that. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Chief if you join me up front here. Chief Yanero. Oh, Okay. Sergeant Philip Williams, if you'll join us. The chief is back. And I'd like to ask Corporal Scott Allen Eichelberger and his family and friends that are here with him tonight if they want to join us up front. Corporal Scott Eichelberger successfully completed the North Carolina Justice Academy Traffic Enforcement and Investigation Certification Program on February 23, 2016. Corporal Eichelberger is the 262nd officer to achieve the certificate since the program's inception in 1999. The Traffic Enforcement and Investigation Certific Certificate Program is designed to recognize the achievement of law enforcement professionals who have dedicated themselves to making the highways safer for our citizens. Upon completion of the program, officers have mastered several important aspects of traffic enforcement, thus achieving a high level of professionalism for themselves and their police departments. The Traffic Enforcement and Investigation Certificate Program requires the participants to be sworn law enforcement officers and have at least two years' experience as a full-time police officer. Participants must have their agency head's approval to participate in the program as it requires 500 hours of training. Corporal Eichelberger is a native of Waterloo, Iowa. He has served with the Jacksonville Police Department since 2009. And prior to his assignment to the 
uh, Police Department's Traffic Division, Corporal Eichelberger, served as a patrol officer and as a community response team officer. He is a graduate of Minnesota State University and holds the, holds the North Carolina Justice Academy's Advanced Law Enforcement Certificate. Corporal Eichelberger is certified as a police training officer, drug recognition expert, and as a tra uh, traffic crash reconstructionist. <clears throat> Scott, at this time, I'd like to present to you this uh, beautiful uh, certificate uh, that they have provided uh, to certify that you completed this uh, in-depth training course at, at the uh, North Carolina Justice Academy on the 29th day of February 2016. And with that, Thank congratulations. You, Good job. You want to say anything? Well, I, I think it's I think it's so important that uh, that we that we recognize them here because out of the 18,000 police officers in the state of North Carolina, his is the 226th certificate, and this has been going on for several years. And and actually, we have several certificates within the department, um, and it, it it truly is a testament to the officers' dedication and their. Uh, their Dedication to the training and the dedication to the, uh, to the city. So it's really, uh, I'm really, really proud, proud of Scott going through that, that uh, rigorous training course. Very good. Well, good job. Thank you. Did you get him? Five hundred hours. That's a lot of training. Um, that brings us to our first section session of public comment for the evening. I have no one having signed up. I don't. Is there anyone that came in after the sheet was taken up that wishes to speak at public comment? Okay. So we'll go on now to adoption of the minutes and the consent items for this meeting. And we have a minutes from a regular workshop meeting on March 8, 2016. Do I have a motion to move, adopt? move to adopt the minutes and the consent items? Second. 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 Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> motion carries. That brings us to <coughs> agenda item number seven on tonight's meeting. And this is a text <coughs> amendment on signage on billboards. And Brian King, Planning and Permitting Administrator, will present this item. Brian. Good evening, Mayor Council. Uh, as you stated, we have before you tonight a proposed staff initiated re, um, unified development ordinance text amendment, and it's pertaining to billboards. And I'd like to give Council uh, and the viewing public some general information and background on billboards in the city of Jacksonville. Basically, a billboard, based on its size and prominence upon the landscape, we constitute it in our unified development ordinance as a separate and distinct land use. And as you can see on the bottom of the screen, um, the items identified here, SP equals permitted, that's in the corridor commercial and the industrial zone. So those are the two zoning districts that billboards are allowed. There's also another aspect of uh, limitations and that's our billboard overlay zone. City Council back in July 3rd, 1984 adopted the billboard overlay zone. Most of the regulations adopted back then are still in place today or they've been slightly modified. In that overlay zone, it states that you can only have billboards in that location and also several other limitations, one of which being they've got to be at least 750 feet away from the intersection. They need to be set back 20 feet from the right of way maximum height of 40 feet, maximum size of 400 square feet. We require that each billboard be identified with a, and DOT does as well, with a placard number. We also have spacing on same side of the streets within the overlay and on opposite sides. So if you're on the same side, basically you need to be 2,000 feet apart and you gotta be 1,000 feet apart from other billboards if you're on the opposite side. 
So just to kind of give you an idea on where the city jurisdiction is, obviously the area in blue is the city limits. The area in green is our ETJ. The area identified in red is our overlay zone. You will see that it's primarily along US Highway 17. There's some on Lejeune Boulevard, Old Western Boulevard, part of Gum Branch Road, part of Belfork Road, and down here at the Triangle area where it splits off a little portion on Wilmington Highway and a small portion on Richlands Highway. Within the city's jurisdiction, there are 89 total billboards. And you can see on the slides before you that uh, there are some that are within the overlay and some that have been here longer than the overlay was adopted or as our territory has grown, they were already in the jurisdiction. So we have some that are outside of the overlay zones. So they, that's one aspect that makes them non-conforming if they're not in that overlay zone. So there's been two recent changes that brings us before you tonight. One is the Modernization Act of 2013. That's basically, that, that pretty much states that a billboard, if it's an old wooden multiple pole structure, can be removed and replaced with a modern structure. A monopole, single pole um, feature provided it basically doesn't change other aspects of the billboard. There's another case that pertains to land use, and that's the Bird versus Franklin County. And we have always looked at zoning as a permissive code, which meant if it's not identified as being allowed, then it's not allowed. Well, this court case basically has changed the rules that pretty much state that just because you don't have it listed means it is allowed, not, not allowed. So that brings us tonight. Because of those changes in that court case, we are basically stating that we need to add this language to our ordinance that will basically expressly state that changeable messages are prohibited within the city of Jacksonville. That's basically the stance the city has taken for, for many years is that the changeable message signs are not permitted on billboards. Because of that court case, we need to codify it. And this is the proposed language that we want to add to our unified development ordinance to make it clear that changeable signs on billboards are not allowed. Be happy to answer any questions that council may have at this time. Council, any questions of Mr. King? I have a question. All right. Ryan, why, <clears throat> I'm just wondering why we feel the need to adopt this change and why other communities are not adopting this change. Communities, Charlotte, Raleigh, Wilmington, why are other areas not doing this and we're electing to try to bring this language forward? What do we see that's prohibitive? I, I would actually say that there are some municipalities that actually still um, prohibit the billboard. But I think that what this does is this allows the city to begin to have, you know, to open the discussions back up with the billboard industry to where maybe we can negotiate some locations where we want to see possibly have LED billboards and then not allow them in other areas. This just will allow us to kind of go back to meet with the billboard industry. Thank you. So you said we're codifying this because it always had been the stance. Yes, sir. That we just rejected them out of hand, LED signs. We just said, we just, someone decided, I mean, I don't think we decided, but it was decided that sign, billboard companies could not bring an LED signed to Jacksonville. Before the court case was basically decided upon last year, the zoning ordinances across the state and across the nation have always been, if it's not specifically listed as allowed, it's just not addressed, then it is not allowed. That court case last year changed, basically did a 180 on that. So we have to codify if we don't want to allow them. Because if not, the billboard industry could come in and say, well, you don't have it listed as either prohibited or allowed, therefore we can do it. Can you give us some more rationale of why we are objecting to this? I mean, this is, you're, we're saying we're not allowing it out of hand 100% when it's actually a, a new technology. I mean, I see us looking, I mean, there's a lot of issues I have with this. I mean, it's. Uh, a property issue. We're talking about taking property rights away, conceivably, from billboard owners, the landholders. I mean, and I'd like to say, first off, you know, personally, I had an incident 
there would be 90 billboards in this overlay sims, except back in the 80s, in a family business I was in, we ended up purchasing a building. And on that location was a billboard, a full-blown construction bill, uh, highway billboard, monopole, modern, and it sat adjacent to our building and was positioned directly above our building in a pretty good location. I mean, it was a, but as time went by, I didn't like it. You know, I'd come to work and I'd look and I'd say, well, boy, that thing is really obstructing my view, you know, it's over dominating our building. And so when the lease came up, we just didn't renew the lease and we had the billboard taken down. And I felt really good, you know, because I came back and I said, that is a beautiful sky. That's a lot prettier than what I had before, and our building was a little more, I uh, think, predominant. So I'm, I'm kind of with you against, as a personal opinion on billboards. But I don't feel like that it's my place to usurp the marketplace, to go against the free market when here is progress approaching and we are diminishing freedom. I mean, we're all about our heroes defending freedom, and here we are taking away people's freedom, conceivably freedom, to do with what they have. So I really can't support this because I, I've, we discussed it earlier, and it's a lot of, you ask why, well, the reason I perceived from our last meeting was fear. Fear that these LED billboards are going to pop up everywhere like fire ant hills in the summer. I mean, it's, they're going to be all over the place. I have more faith in the market. I mean, we, we don't like billboards. I mean, can we just say that? Is that where we're at here? Or no, we, we can't say that. <laughs> Mr. Carter, you had something you wanted to interject into Mr. King's... Yes, I want to go back to Mr. Lazaro's statement. Well, Wilmington, Molly, everybody else relies on why not we? But let me just tell you about Wilmington. Wilmington does have an ordinance. First of all, the DOT says that these electronic billboards <clears throat> can change every eight seconds during a 60-minute cycle, if you will. Wilmington's ordinance, which we have looked at, they sat down with the industry, which is what we hope to do if council approves this or doesn't approve it. We still want to sit down with the industry and have a conversation. In Wilmington, they is a certain, the industry and they agreed on a certain percentage of their static boards, those with no LED lights, that they could be switched over to LED boards. They agreed to that, that's in their ordinance. They also agreed instead of every, that Wilmington's code says this, you don't change every eight seconds, you only change every 15 seconds, unless you give one of those eight seconds in that 60-minute cycle to uh, for public service announcements. So there are benefits to the city that we might be able to negotiate on behalf of our citizens. So, uh, so what you're saying is this will help us uh, define a negotiating stance. We, uh, we believe We're not that. necessarily wanting to preclude anybody from putting up a billboard, but before it becomes etched or before it becomes demanded on us, we want a position of negotiation. And if I can I. And I have no issues with what you just said. The, the thing that bothers me about this whole thing is that we're using this language as a negotiating tool. We've allowed these companies to have X amount of billboards for however many years. It's their billboard. They have a right to it, to that size, to that square footage, to whatever message they deem fit to play. And now that new technology has come aboard, we're saying, hey, we don't like that technology. We want to have some conversation. So therefore, we're going to include some language to make you have that conversation. I think it ought to be the other way around. I think we ought to have the conversation and come up with some reasonable, uh, you don't want it to change for every 30 seconds, an hour, whatever. That's completely reasonable. Or whatever we deem fit to do, but to just say, you can't have them. Well, I don't think we're saying that. But That's you are exactly saying that. That's exactly what it says. Hey, Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, um, I can go along with what everybody said. Um, but in the meantime, before there is this um, industry-supported agreement, if you will, 
something can be constructed that does not comply with what you eventually come up with in a, as an agreement if you don't have something in place. But approaching this from a totally different angle, at the National League of Cities uh, conference, I attended this session that dealt with um, all of the new laws, and they had the attorneys come in to address different things. I didn't get a chance to talk about the Oxford House, but and they didn't bring it up. I was sort of surprised. I thought other people would be having that problem. But they did talk about signs, and they talked about this um, um, these series of laws, and um, I'm not prepared to discuss it tonight. I just wanted to bring it up so that we could get some follow-up research on it. But it approached signs from a free speech angle. And it, there, there used to be this distinction between political speech, commercial and retail speech, and, and just vaguely based off what I was gathering was that that line has merged and that you have free speech in a commercial context too. And so there was a lot of restrictions that are being placed on what cities can do with signs as a result of that uh, free speech position. And so I, I would like to know more about that from our expert at a later date. That's fine. You probably heard about the Reed case. Was that mentioned? I think so. Yes, okay. it was. We'll, we'll be glad to try to share more with you. That's the United States Supreme Court case that, that doesn't just apply to billboards. It applies to all signs Correct. and about and, and those issues that, that it raised. We need to know that. Let me give you just a, a little bit more background. Approximately four years ago, we were addressed by representatives of one of the larger billboard industries about doing uh, LEDs, the changeable message. At that time, it was our position in our interpretation of the code that they were not permitted. But we told the industry at that time we were willing to analyze it as long as we could find a public good. I agree 100% with what Mr. Thomas said about private property rights. Private property rights are always going to be the hallmark. That's one of the reasons why America was founded, was private property rights. At the same time, you have to determine at what point do you limit those rights. You know, for example, before airplanes were invented, the theory on owning land was that you owned from the center of the earth through the sky all the way to heaven. Well, because airplanes were invented and they said, well, yeah, I get to fly over John's house without having to pay a fee. That's really what we're talking about here. What's a balance? Now, I'll be the first to tell you that I don't believe that of the 89 billboards that are out there, that if you don't pass this tonight, that you'll have 89 applications in for digital billboards. On the other hand, I'll also remind you of this. A static billboard is worth something. A changeable billboard that can change every hour, every 30 minutes, is worth a lot more. For example, I like Bowberry Biscuits. I also like Lazera subs. If you have the ability on a changeable message board to say at 6.30 in the morning, drop by and get this, and at 10 o'clock in the morning, drop by and get that for lunch, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, drop by and get fried chicken on the way home, which I dearly love, it means that that, that value has gone up. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what the American system is. Knowing, though, that the industry is going to be able to get so much more. Why did we originally limit billboards? We originally limited billboards because we said only so much is acceptable in our community. And that's what you're really saying here. While yes, at the moment we're saying no more digitals, because I'll remind those that were in the workshop, we do have two, I'm sorry, we do have one that will go up because the permit was applied for before we took this action. At the end, I will tell you, there will be a staff report and recommendation to you that allows digital billboards. This is simply whether we should be doing it this way or not, and that's, that's y'all's decision. If you feel that we're negotiating the wrong way, then you should tell us that. On the other hand, this gives us a negotiating position. It's a stronger position than no ordinance. On the other hand, even if you say table this tonight, we're still going to have meetings within the next two weeks with the billboard industry to try to negotiate because 
in government and in the private sector, there is a responsibility to try to balance between the value of private rights and the value of social conscience. I am one that is opposed to having 89 digital billboards in this city. Many years ago, long before you were elected, this city was written up in one of the national planning magazines as one of the ugliest cities from the standpoint of sign regulation. We can still show you in the APA, American Planning Association journals, a picture that was basically taken of 17 from basically where the Dunkin' Donut is today looking up towards Kentucky Fried Chicken. And it showed all those billboards. Because of that, your, your predecessors changed the regulations. We don't want Jacksonville to be the poster child for abandoning private property rights. But we also don't want Jacksonville to be the poster child for just unregulated things. Uh, you know, it's a philosophical decision. I, I honor any of you who say that in this case, private property rights trump government regulation. And if you do that, that's fine. We're still going to negotiate the best we can. Our hope is that we can find a way of allowing digital billboards to come to Jacksonville while still regulating them so that they don't if I may use the term, overcome Jacksonville. And I, I completely agree with everything you said. I have no problem with the regulation of the amount of billboards, the height of billboards. I don't think they should be able to relocate if one burns down. And, and all those things I'm in full agreement with, 100%. But what I don't agree with is if I have a billboard right now and I'm allowed this billboard and I'm paying for this billboard and I've kept it up and I lease it out and I've changed the message every 30 days and now I'm willing to invest a million dollars to put up a digital board that you're going to prohibit me. That's the only part that I really have an issue with. So personally, uh, only because they're not doing anything different. They're just putting up a newer technology to do the same thing that they were allowed to do. But everything else you said, I'm in full agreement with. I don't think we need 89 billboards. But I think that's a different discussion, personally. I, but that's just where I'm at. Well, let's go ahead and uh, any other questions around? Just make a comment. Uh, you know, if, we're, if we agree that, that too many bill, billboards are not, not aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing in Jacksonville, now, what number is is a good number for aesthetically pleasing billboards in Jacksonville? I don't know. Maybe it's 50. Maybe maybe a, a hundred wouldn't be so bad. But all we're doing in, with this measure right here is giving a negotiating tool. We're not saying. I, I forget what it says. We're not really saying we're not going to allow billboards. Exactly. We're actually we're actually trying to give the manager and staff some negotiating basis that they can sit down with the billboard industry and come up with some compromise that the citizens of Jacksonville can live with and that we can live with and the billboard industry can live with. They're not going to be able to afford, I mean, I don't think, I'd, well, maybe, maybe some point, but right now changing 89 billboards is cost prohibitive for all of them, but some of them will be changed to LED. We might be willing to, they might be willing to negotiate reducing the amount of billboards in town for the ability to put some of them as LEDs. I don't know. But I think we need to at least give the manager some negotiating power in this. We're going to, he's going to come back. We're going to, we're going to allow LED billboards. We all know we are. But we need to do it on our terms, what we think for the citizens of Jacksonville. And I'd like to see us support this. Any other questions, Ron? All right. At this time, we'll recess the regular meeting and open the public hearing. It's required on a text amendment. Anyone wishing to speak to this matter? Indicate by raising your hand. Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and reconvene the uh, meeting. Council, you're being asked to uh, 
approve the zoning text amendment found in attachment A? Mr. Mayor, as one of those predecessors who um, supported the original ordinance, the intent has not changed, uh, the law changed. And this sort of rolls it back to what the status was. So I um, move for adoption of the amendment. Second. <clears throat> all right, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Hey. Let's see it. Hands? Two. 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 Okay. Record it. Clerk. One final comment? Uh, Mr. Manager, if we're going to discourage, if we want to discourage billboards, I think we should perhaps discuss with our TDA their use of billboards. Um, I haven't seen anybody else enter the room on public comment, so we'll go straight to reports. I'm going to start with Mr. Willingham. I um, had a chance to meet with um, Chief of Staff of Walter Jones, discuss some things that um, Mayor Pro Tem Lazar uh, brought up in the Military Communities uh, Committee uh, on the census, and they were receptive. No further report. Mr. Bennett? No report this evening. Mayor Pro Tem Lazar. Thank you, Mayor. Also attended the NLC uh, with the League of Municipalities, and we met with uh, Senator Burr and Senator Tillis, also working on um, the uh, census for our military personnel. Also support for CDBG funding, to continued support for that and all the good things <coughs> that it does and also uh, preserving the tax exemption on municipal bonds and several other issues, but it was a very, very productive session. Thank you. Mr. Warden. No report, sir. Proud to be here. Mr. Thomas. <laughs> no report. Are you, you proud to be here? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Ms. Washington. Um, I had an opportunity also to attend the National League of City Conference and just a couple of tenant points that my colleagues um, did not mention. There's also support in the Senate for the Senate to pass legislation on closing the sales um, tax loophole as it relates to on sale taxes right now because we know brick and mortar buildings, retails can charge taxes, but however, online taxes is not applicable right now, so we're pushing for Congress to pass a law on on sales um, tax. Also, there is a criminal justice reform. Many people may have heard about this. Um, supporting for Congress to pass the Sentencing Reform and Correction Acts to give judges greater discretion in sentencing low-level offenders and to reduce recidivism by matching federal prisoners to programs designed to help them successfully re-enter back into society. Also to encourage Congress to pass the second act reauthorization, um, which is also sort of like banning of the box to provide resources to local governments to improve the outcome for individuals returning back to communities um, along with reducing recidivism. And the last one um, is pushing Congress to reauthorize and modernize the Environmental Protection Agency known as the Brownfields Program. And this is more for clarification to expand um, not having liabilities or having liability protection when cities basically um, acquire contaminated properties through no fault of their own was involved in the contamination process and for the EPA to give greater finances back to cities in order to clean up those properties. And that's it. Thank you. Your real appointment. Oh, your appointment. Yeah. Oh. Well, I was going to mention that. Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we'll let Richard I'll give, I'll give more bang for your buck. There. I'll let you. All right. All in one. Uh, I had an opportunity. Oh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, oh, I have uh, disconnected myself. Can I say one more thing? I forgot there. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry. I also had an opportunity to... Um, to go to the, I had an invitation to go to the White House for a White House briefing um, where I had an opportunity with several other NLC Congress delegates to meet with Valerie Jarrett and to meet with the United States Secretary of Education, Mr. Um, Dr. Ron oh God, um, Jones. Um, 
I think that's his name. I am so sorry. I just took a blank. Um, excuse me. His name is Dr. King. I apologize for that. Um, and also, we had an opportunity to meet with um, our drug czar that really talked about the, um, the amount of heroin and opiate addictions and overdoses that we are now seeing in our cities and encouraging Congress to give um, monies and funding to cities in order to combat um, the opiate overdoses and to correct this problem that's currently happening in our cities. And, um, and so, yes, that's the end of my report. I'm Thank sorry. I um, had a, one of our longtime retired employees of the city passed away this past week. Uh, Captain uh, Claude Gordon Bradley uh, passed away. He served the police department from about 1954 to 1984. Uh, uh, in my eyes, a good man, great man, because uh, he's one of the ones that kind of guided me through that career uh, when I first got into it, uh, and he'll be sh surely missed in the community. He was 89 years old. Uh, with that, Dr. Woodruff. Mayor, the first thing I would like to mention is uh, the fact we're very proud of the fact that Councilmember Washington has been appointed as a vice chair to a committee of the National League of Cities. I believe it was a year, maybe two years ago, you were appointed as a member of that, and now you're appointed as the vice chair. So. Congratulations on that. We look forward to helping and assisting you in that work. And there's so. another appointment, the one to the real initiative oh. that came out last okay. week. Okay. So. Well, we have two appointments for us, yes. so that, that's good. <laughs> uh, a couple of other things we would like to remind the public. Uh, this is uh, the week that Easter will come. That means that Friday, the City Hall and all services of the city other than emergency services will be closed. That means that there'll be no horticultural pickup this week. The garbage that's normally picked up on Thursday will be picked up on Wednesday. The garbage that's normally picked up on Friday will be picked up on Thursday. Next week, we'll return to normal service. It's hard to believe that with springtime here, we're already talking about summer camps. This is the week where city residents have the opportunity to sign up first for the slots in our summer camps. Next week, both city residents and non-city residents may sign up, but this week, it is for city residents only. We would also like to mention that um, Sturgeon City is an item that we have talked with you a number of times. We would like to let you know we continue with the leadership of the city attorney and with hired counsel to try to get a closure on landfill issues down at Sturgeon City that are holding up the potential construction of that building. We met in January in uh, Raleigh thought we had come to an agreement. Unfortunately, two months have now passed and we're still seeing that the folks who are now with uh, you, formerly known as Diener, uh, continue to ask additional questions. And at this point, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. We haven't even found the tunnel, apparently, on that issue. But we do want to let you and the public know that the staff, especially the city attorney, is continuing to try to find a solution relative to that matter down at Sturgeon City. Until that does happen, we, we will not be able to proceed with the, with the project. In the very near future, we're going to be bringing to you a discussion regarding the Sturgeon City building. We do anticipate beginning our budget workshops in April. Uh, we will meet every Tuesday in April. I know that uh, several of you have, have indicated that you may be absent for one or two of those meetings. Let's see. The last thing that we would like to mention, uh, as always, is we appreciate the leadership, Mayor, that you and the Council are giving. We look forward to the budget discussions starting within the next several weeks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Woodruff. Also, um, Appreciate the tour tonight with the workshop. It gave us an opportunity to look at some of the projects and the progress that we're making. Uh, good, uh, good. Some of them are looking pretty good. Things are, uh, it's nice to see things dynamic uh, changing all the time here in Jacksonville. And I, I think all these are, are some very positive things that we saw tonight and we look forward to uh, their future development and uh, future completion. And that ball field, ball field, is, that ball field. If you like have a big ballpark, you've got to go see it. That is beautiful. Great job on that.
But with that, I would entertain a motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, you got anything? Are you sure? <laughs> you never hear a whole lot to say after the meeting. Uh, okay. uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. You can